preaching about separation and knowing and understanding what separation is. We, we've kind of laid the groundwork for that, but I had mentioned uh, the brain waves, and one of the brain waves we we're focusing on now is the theta brain wave, and that is the brain wave through where the enemy gives us thought. It hits our spirit, and it goes through the theta brain waves and hits our mind up here, and that's how it gets processed. The Holy Spirit also speaks to us through that brain wave also. Incredible stuff. Like I said last Sunday, man, I'm not a science guy by any means. I'm not a neuroscientist, anything. I'm a pastor. That's what God's called me to do. And the things that I learn, I try to chew on them, uh, pull out of them what, what I can, and allow the Lord to speak them from my heart, hopefully in a simple way for you to grasp and understand. We had a book years ago. I still have the book by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She's a, she's a neuroscience scientist, studies the brain, all the, the scientific parts of things going on in the body and everything. And it's an incredible book, incredible insight. And I read it, and I laid it down, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I had to pick it up and read it again because I didn't understand it. And I read it again, and I read it one more time. And I started, because she talks up here. Man, those people are smart. I'm telling you, I'm just your average guy, average Joe, or whatever you want to call it. But she was talking way up here, and I try my best to keep it right here. And I'm hoping I do that for you guys so that you can take hold of it and grasp it and understand it. Some of you have got, man, your IQs are way up here, and I don't want to know about that. Some of you guys, wow, incredible, man, in incredible. What is it? The b book was, um, what was the name of the book? It's Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Oh, Carolyn Leaf. Yeah, it's Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's good, man. I gleaned a lot out of it. But one of the things, this is what I was going to share. A few years later, and we taught that book here. Man, we, we dug into it and we worked it over, and, and man, it helped us a lot. It helped a lot of y'all. But a few years later, we came across Freedom in Christ Ministries. Freedom in Christ, huh? Yeah, it was a few months later. That's right. Because our, you know, and that's the great thing is <clears throat> our hearts were in that direction. It's like, God, we want to know this. We want to understand it. We want to be able to comprehend so we can take responsibility for our lives and do what you've called us to do. And some of y'all remember Amy, Amy Gilliam. She married uh, Darren, and Darren took her away from us. <laughs> Dar yeah, a long way. Well, they went to Wyoming, wasn't it? They're in Florida. That's right. Yeah. Update. They, he took a job over in Florida. We were praying for him about that and looked like they weren't going to do it. And then after a while, they decided, you know what? Let's do that. Um, and they got the pay that they needed. That was the kicker was they weren't getting what they needed to get. And they, like, oh, and they held off and then they finally came back with a counter offer. And now they're in Florida. Beautiful place to be. But Amy was the one that shared with us Freedom Christ Ministries. And she had never read it before. She had just uh, had it. And she's like, hey, I think this would be something. It was up for the kids. And Sandy started reading. She's like, man, this is powerful. This is awesome. So we started getting into that. And the synopsis of this is what Carolyn Leaf was teaching. Great stuff. Man, it powerful. But Freedom in Christ brought it down on this level. And I could understand it. The stronghold busting. If you want to know about stronghold busting, just ask me and I'll tell you what it's about. But that was the equipping that we needed, and it's equipped many of you to be able to stand your ground and prepare for the battle, because we know there's battles out there every day, right? There's going to be a battle tomorrow. There may be one today. But if you will prep like David did and prove, he proved his sling, did he not? He did not prove Saul's armor. That's why he didn't put it on. He said, I have not proved it. I have not tested it. I have not used it. I ain't putting your armor on. I'm going out with what I know that I can do with the strength of Almighty God. And he went out and met Goliath with one stone. He had five of them, I think is what it had. But with one stone, he knocked that dude down, took his own sword, and cut his head off. And he paraded around with that dude's head. Boy, it was huge because he was a, he was a giant. He paraded around with it, and he took his sword also. Incredible. But the thing of it is, is training. Training, training, training. The Word of God says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. I truly believe that, that we have our times that we 
kind of get off a little bit, and then we come back. Me and my mom and daddy, they trained and trained and trained me, and I got off for a while, but eventually I realized, well, this is not the way to go. <laughs> and I got back on the path, hallelujah. But we're talking about separation this morning, and, and what I finished up with last Sunday was disease does not just happen. Disease does not just happen. It is not happenstance. It is a mindset that brings it on. It's been proven also that our words towards uh, plants, and, that, and that's where I finished up. I started talking about the study of words that you even speak to plants, and my brother did that probably 20-some-odd years ago and saw the results of it. It's incredible. But not loving yourself, man, that's been a tough one for me all my life because I had rejection and unloving at a very, very early age. I would say that it was there when I was in the womb. Jolene and I have talked about that many times. She says, you had that one in the womb. She says, when you were conceived, it was there. And I'm like, yeah, I think so. You know, and just things that, that happened and transpired. But not loving yourself and listening to self-hatred, self-unforgiveness, self-bitterness, rage, anger, and even murder by the tongue towards yourself, all it is is an instruction manual to your body and even your mind to self-destruct in a totally totally kill you. It's, that's what its design is. All the selves, when we look at the diseases that are caused by those things, I say, okay, that one falls in the category of selves. And when I say selves, it's self-hatred. It's not loving yourself, okay? That is the gist of that in that respect. It's designed to eliminate you, not by God, but by the devil. I've heard people say, yeah, the Lord gave me this. I'm going to take this one to the grave. And I'm like, yeah, you think that, you will be taking it to the grave. I'm going to tell you right now, God didn't give it to you. It is a mindset that the enemy has programmed you in, and you've got to understand that in order to get in a place of separation so you can start walking in your healing and what God has given you. God's original design for us was in the garden, having and knowing significance, acceptance, and security. You remove one of these and replace it with the thoughts of the opposite, then it will affect you even to the effect of your body. It's going to affect your mind, will, and emotions. It's going to affect your body. Your body just responds to what you're chewing on. Remember the old, I don't know, some of y'all may remember the old commercial on TV, you are what you eat. Well, yeah, in a way that's kind of to some degree. I mean, I don't eat Big Macs and turn into a Big Mac, but the things that we ingest, and I would, I would say spiritually, it's what is forming us. It's forming these thoughts. It's forming a picture of how we see ourselves. Listen, you ought to be your best friend next to yourself. You ought to be somebody that really cares for you and loves you. I'm telling you, God does. Amen? But you ought to care for yourself. If you go to the mirror and you look at yourself, you know, many times I'll wake up in the morning and it's like, wow. Sandy calls it a Joan Jett hair day. <clears throat> uh, my, what is it? Phyllis Diller. You know what mine is? Mine's a Rod Stewart. <laughs> it's like, whoa, man. I'm like, yeah, you're a good-looking guy, but with the funny-looking hair up there, you know, all over the place. It doesn't take much to get it back in place, praise the Lord. But you ought to be able to go in and look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself and say, ah, man, I love you. God loves you. You're the next thing best of peanut butter or whatever, you know? Seriously. You ought to say, I love you. Amen. Let's say that together. Say, I love myself. I am, worthy I am worthy to receive love, to receive love from, my father, from my Father, from others, from others and, even and even from myself. Do you believe that? Yes. That is the truth. And if you get a hold of that, then you're getting a hold of the core of this message. And I need you to see and understand where the enemy has come in. God wants you to see it. So that you can start separating yourself from those stinking lies, as we like to say that they are. This is one reason I try to get you to understand that toxic situations and toxic people are areas we need to distance ourselves from and install healthy boundaries. I've told people for years and years and years and years, people that struggle with drug addictions and things like that, I tell them, okay, number one, you can get delivered. Number two, you need to work on loving yourself, dealing with all the self stuff. Number three, you need to get yourself out of the midst of that toxicity. I've told people that they even need to just pack their bags and move to another town before. 
I've told people that they need to pack their bags and move in with us. I'm not telling you to do that. <clears throat> if you want to live in a tent up on the mountain, you can do that, I guess. No. <laughs> but we have got to get out of it. It's hard when you get deliverance, you start walking in that deliverance, getting your mind renewed according to 12, Romans 12, 2, and then you step right back into a toxic situation. I had a young man that... Uh, that I worked with years ago at Home Depot in New Braunfels. And, man, he was a, he was a smart cookie. He was a, a, a plumber. And he told me, he said, man, when I was real young, and he was still young, <laughs> but he was smaller and everything. He says, you know what I used to do with the plumbers? I said, what was that? He says, they would pull off the cover to the septic system. And he says, they'd hold me by my legs, and I'd take a flashlight, and they'd dip me down in there, not into it. He says, but I, they would spin me around, and I'd look around there and find the issues. And I said, man, did you ever, did they ever let go of you? He's, man, a couple of times they teased me like they were going to. He's, but they never did. But I thought about that, and I've thought about that over the years. That is a septic situation. <laughs> Seriously, it's toxic. You don't want to be in that. So how would it be to let him go and then pull him back out and say, all right, let's get you cleaned up, and let's try that again. And then they let him go again. Get him cleaned up. And they say, I think about after the first, first time, I'd say, I don't think so. You're not using me anymore. But that is a picture that I get with toxicity and things that are going on. We need to distance ourselves as far away from that as we can. Man, I've, I've had to even block people on my phone before that uh, through relationships and things that were just not healthy. I would get around them until I started getting to a place where I could stand for myself and stand and know that I know that I know that I know that I know, I had to say, you know what? No. People that were manipulators, controllers, and things like that, and say, no. You're not coming into this area right here. Because for me, that created toxicity. And I encourage you that if you have that going on in your life, it's okay. I, I, I was at uh, Heart of Forgiveness teaching at the, the, the conference there in Lampasas a couple months ago. And I told the people, I said, it's okay when we were doing deliverance. I said, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say I'm done here. Because what you're doing is you're setting a boundary up. So many of us get manipulated, we get controlled. And then after the fact, we go into this place of self-hatred, maybe even hatred against the others. But we get in that place that's not a good place because we've allowed the enemy to come in and trampled over our boundaries. Boundaries are important, folks. My wife's daddy, uh, Rocky, he always says, boundaries make good neighbors. Fences make good neighbors. And I'm like, yeah, they do. And did you know that Jesus even had boundaries? It's a good thing to have, folks, because it creates healthy relationships. We need to have boundaries for ourselves even. It's like you, you, if you're struggling with overeating and things like that, would you go to the store and buy you a bunch of chocolate cakes? <clears throat> that sounds pretty good to me, actually. We were there the other night, and I was looking at the chocolate. You know, they, they do this to us at, at these stores, man. You walk in, you've done your shopping and stuff, and you get up front, and it's like there's all the goodies. The chocolate pies. Mrs. Freshly or Mrs. Whatever. The chocolate pies, the chocolate donuts. Sandy doesn't like those chocolate donuts. She's it's like eating wax. And I was like, yeah, I love it. Chocolate wax. It's good <laughs> stuff. But how would it be for me to just turn that thing over in my, my basket? She'd be looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, man, i got to have me some donuts, you know? But we do that because it's out of programming. And it will mess with you. You need boundaries for yourself. So you wouldn't go to the store and just pile it in. Maybe we've done that in the past. I, don't know. I tell her, don't take me shopping when I'm hungry. That's the worst thing you can do. How many of y'all do that? That's not good, man. Toby, you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll just leave him at home, Glenda. Yeah. Yes, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. We need healthy boundaries. Y'all agree with that? Come on. You can't do this without... The, the understanding of who the enemy is. And I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy is not the person. It's not the person. But there needs to be probably some boundaries set up for that person because of things that they may be listening to. 
So who is the enemy? Satan, the devil, his little minions, his low-level devils, as we like to call them, amen? And they are low-level. Low-level, my dad, one time, I don't think we're supposed to see demons. I think periodically the Lord may open up that spiritual realm. Well, when I was a kid, I used to see demons. And there was a door that was open that should not have been open, and I know it came through my daddy. But my daddy tells a story one time, he was in his office preparing for church one Sunday. Uh, It was a Saturday night, and he says, in through the door that was closed, walked this little demon. He said, he was about the shape of a football. And he said, man, he was ugly, but he stood about this tall. And he said, man, I started praying and pleading the blood of Jesus. And I, he said, as soon as I started speaking the, the name of Jesus, that thing got so frustrated and aggravated. And he said, you could just see it all over. He turned around and it went out. We need to not allow demons to come into our presence, whether hearing them or seeing them. There needs, if you're seeing demons, number one, there needs to be a, a door shut there. I realized way later in life that there was a door open through some stuff in my life, through ancestral stuff. I got that closed and repented for it. I always, I say the same thing Jolene says, man, I don't want to see them, Lord. <laughs> you can just, I, I know they're there through discernment, but I don't want to see them, you know? Amen? So the enemy is the devil. It is his kingdom. If you don't get this, then you will not only have your life running on autopilot by the enemy and affecting you mentally, physically, but it will also affect others by this open door. That's what happens. When I listen to the enemy, I'm going to tell you right now, it affects my family. When you listen to the enemy, it affects your family. That is the truth. When we step, I believe God's got a covering for us. I heard somebody say years ago that it's like an umbrella. And here's all this stuff coming down and everything. And we're like, here, hold that for me. And we step out over here. Next thing you know is you start getting it on you. Or you close it up and you set it down. It's getting on you, now getting on your family. It needs not be that way, folks. We need to stay under God's covering. We need to stay within his hedge that he has set up for us in order to keep us safe and to protect us. Amen? Bitterness, unforgiveness, rebellion, accusation, critical spirits, rejection, unloving are just the enemy's thoughts for you. That's all they are. It's the enemy's thoughts of what he has trained us in, what he's programmed us in to do. It's his thoughts for you. He wants you to surrender to them. And when you do, what you're doing is following suit in performing his plan. And his plan is for your life. Do you think the devil's got a good thing for you waiting for you? No, he ain't got nothing good for you. He wants to affect you and he wants to affect as many people as he can. I'm going to tell you in the very beginning, he affected a whole race of humanity. When he was able to get to Eve by deceiving her and then because of Adam's transgression, knowingly, it affected a whole race with one stone. Don't let him continue that one in your life. Set the boundaries and say, you know what? No, I'm done with that. Yes. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of a song, I forget, that Martin Luther wrote, similar to those words. But yeah, he he gets joy out of that. He gets his kicks. You know those saying, get your kicks on Route 66? That's his Route 66, if he can get you. How many of y'all been out to Tucumcari? Mitch, you got me off on this one. Not for a long time, yeah. It's a little short area of the Route 66. It's really cool. We went to Kansas to the teaching. That's the way we went. And we stopped in Tucumcari. It was Tucumcari, wasn't it? And they got all through that town, all these old restaurants, diners, gas stations. And even some of the gas stations, they're not open, but they've cleaned them up. They've painted them. It's really cool. It's worth a drive out there to see it. But it's a neat little town to go through. That has nothing to do with this that I'm talking about here. But squirrel. Yeah, pastor has squirrels. Yeah. 
Before we move on, let me share with you some discoveries that have been made in neuroscience. These are not my discoveries because, like I said, I'm not a neuroscientist. But it's things that they have documented and it's fact. Reading your Bible, how many of y'all read your Bible? How many have a Bible? How many brought your Bible? Praise the Lord. It's on my phone, Pastor. Okay. At least you got it. Praise the Lord. Reading your Bible brings about some incredible neurological and physical benefits. In reading your Bible, there are three areas in the brain that are most active during these times. These areas are the frontal attention lobe, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the nucleus accumbens. I, yeah, yeah, I got those kind of pronounced. Yeah. All, I just know it's part of our, our head up here, man. <laughs> All of these experience significant increases in activity and responsiveness during religious activities. So if they were able to come in here and say, okay, Let's do this next Sunday. I'll get, get them over here and we'll get all these things hooked up to you. We can all just sit out there with all these wires hooked up our heads. And when we start worshiping, there's something going to happen. Sandy's shaking her head like, no. <laughs> That'd probably be very expensive. But they say that when they get them all hooked up and you start doing religious activities, worshiping the Lord, reading the Bible, praying or whatever, those areas in the brain, they just start really spiking and really doing something. It has been found that high amounts of dopamine are released through the body while reading the Bible. Did you know that? Just reading your Bible. High amounts of dopamine are released. When dopamine is released, you are likely to be more focused, motivated, and happy. God put that in there, folks. He put it in there because it's something that comes in and keeps us grounded. It keeps us level. Reading the Bible can affect neural pathways in the brain. These pathways are in charge of cognitive thinking and behavior. Why do you think the devil wants you to not read your Bible? How many of you get your Bible out and you start reading and after a little while you're... devil don't want you reading it. It's occultism. If you can't read your Bible and stay awake, you've got occultism going on in your life. If you can't stay awake at church, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a boring preacher. <laughs> I pulled up one of my, I pulled up my message from Sunday before last on, on this. And I was like, wow, man, that's for, it's not me, it's God, but God's created me this way. If you can't stay engaged, then I would say you've got some occultism going on in your life. There's something there that needs to be dealt with because you ought to be able to have control of yourself, of your faculties. And if you find yourself falling asleep in church, just come to me and we'll, we'll cast that thing out. It's cultism probably. It, more than likely, it's probably Freemasonry. Freemasonry is not good. That's not what we're here to talk about today, though. Just think about this. Reading the Bible does a lot more than just affect the brain because once certain parts of the brain are activated, emotional responses begin to show not only inward but outward in the form of behavioral changes as well. Incredible, man. Just reading your Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to read your Bible more. Say, I need to read my Bible more. Yeah. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Hallelujah. One of the things taken from humanity in the garden was God walking with Adam, folks. Walking with him in the cool of the day and speaking with him 
So think about a dialogue between you and God in reading the Bible and the significance of it. Man, you, you can walk with him 24-7. Yeah, I think you can, walk, you can walk with him while you're sleeping too, praise God. I've done deliverance while I'm dreaming before. The devil's tried to get into my, my thoughts and my dreams. Next thing I know, in Jesus' name, get out of here. And I'm like, wow, who's that? <laughs> walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit during the day, you will walk in the Spirit while you're sleeping. Think about a dialogue between you and God in reading the Bible and the significance of it. If God's word is God breathed, breathed, then is not just reading the Bible an affirmation from God alone? Affirmation from God alone to you, but also his spirit confirming his word also in you? Think of the significance. Think of the acceptance. And think of the security in this. Think about it. Reading the Bible encourages goal-oriented behaviors. It also encourages behaviors such as praying. It works the Mesolimbic dopaminergic, D-O-P-A-M-I-N-E-R-G-I-C. I can't even say that one. System. But it's connected to dopamine. It's the system that releases the dopamine. Reading the Bible also encourages community activities. Wow. Reading the Bible encourages community activity. So reading the Bible will actually encourage you to want to fellowship more. Wow. Wow, man, that's pretty cool. It will cause you to find a community of like-minded people to surround yourself with. Just from reading the Bible. That is phenomenal, man. It also affects your thoughts. In Proverbs 23, 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, it's what you're dwelling on. It's where you've pulled the car up, put it in park, and you're sitting there idling. Or maybe you've turned it off and you're just staying put right there. It's where you are settling down in. It says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. It has been discovered that if you dedicate just 30 minutes a day in reading your Bible, it will improve your concentration. That is incredible. Just 30 minutes a day. Look at your neighbor and say, try it. We have a free trial offer today uh, for the next 30 days. If you'll just try it for 30 minutes a day. <clears throat> for twenty nine 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 ninety five, yeah, thirty minutes a day. Wow, I mean that—that's it's like, well, give me some more, Lord. <laughs> He's given me a whole book. Hallelujah, Amen. But with that said, if your predisposition in reading the Bible is connected with negative emotions, so here we go. If your predisposition in reading the Bible is connected with negative emotions. So let me say, you read the Bible and you get condemned. That is not good. I've known lots of people that have been there. Predisposition in reading the Bible is connected with negative emotions. Then it will have an effect that will connect you to accusations and the like. That's why it's imperative to understand Father's love and that the Bible is written to instruct you not to condemn you. Man, I, I've, I've read, before I started allowing the Lord to wash over this brain, this mind, my heart, my emotions and everything, man, I used to read Scripture and, like, oh man, that's condemning. I guess I'm just not really a believer. I must not really belong to God. Well, I've got to understand who my Father is in heaven, folks. Yes, Glenda. Bringing in the spirits of guilt and shame. Bringing in the spirits of guilt. I would say they're there. Yes. 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 Because it's accusation. Listen, you can't separate a thought from an entity. 
Let me, let me stress that. You cannot separate a thought from an entity. There's only three places it comes from. Yourself, God, or the enemy. Yourself, God, or the enemy. Oh, I just happened to walk into a bubble of thought of, oh, I don't love myself. Oh, that was a boop. Just, oh, I just don't love myself today. Boop. Oh, I reject myself today. No, they're not bubbles of thought just floating around out there. They're spirits. It's the enemy trying to get you to not love yourself and take you down a rabbit hole of self-destruction. That's why it's imperative to understand Father's love. And that the Bible is written to instruct you not to condemn you. Tell the story of Amy, honey, when she first came to us. Amy spent about a, almost a year with us. If she was here, she's given us permission. She said, I give you permission to talk about me all you want if it'll help somebody. I'm like, praise the Lord, sister. I said, I talk enough about myself. I said, we'll talk about you too. She said, that's good. I like that. But tell the, tell the story here. So when Amy came to stay with us, we would, we would do a lot of deliverance with her. But one of the things that we encouraged her to do was read her Bible so that she could have a relationship with Jesus. And she would come down from upstairs where she lived in our little tower and she would have this look on her face like she was so condemned and so sad. And we're like, weren't you just reading your Bible? Yes, and it told me I'm going to hell and I'm going to, you know, I'm not a good mother and I'm not a good person. And we're like, well, what were you reading? Well, I was reading the, the Gospels or whatever. And we're like, that is not what the Bible says. And so we'd have to talk to her and f find out that she was coming at it with a thought process that the Bible was condemning instead of encouraging. She did not know who her father God was. And she did, even though she had freedom in Christ in her, in her room, she never read it. So um, she did not know who God was, did not know who God, how much God loved her. And that caused her to read the Bible in a way that was horrible for her. She couldn't get anything good out of it. Does that make sense? That's when I talk about predisposition. Get the Father's love letter, see if you can get it pulled up. Can, is that possible this morning? Okay, get it pulled up because I think that's what we need to listen to before we dismiss. <clears throat> predisposition. There's generational things that predispose us to doing things the same way the generations before us did it. it it's been proven, guys, in the DNA through the RNA process. I talked about that a couple of Sundays ago. It, a, it is a gene that is asleep, and when you entertain it, it comes alive. And when it comes alive, then it starts working. I said... Uh, two Sundays ago that sometimes we see people that have so many things that are generational but a lot of stuff gets canceled out just by simply them giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ because when a person gives their life to Jesus what they need to be understanding and I think this is man this is a huge disconnect in a lot of our churches today it was a huge disconnect in me growing up was getting a hold of who I am in the Lord that is massive. Because once you start understanding it, Jeff, once you start understanding who you are in the Lord, then man, your love just oozes out of you for those kiddos. Once I started understanding that who I was, man, my love for my children just skyrocketed. And for my wife. And even for myself. Was that a struggle? Yeah, it was a struggle. And I had to keep telling myself, that's not me speaking to me. That's the enemy speaking to me in order to keep me pushed back, keep me held back. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, folks, one of the things I learned, this is a tactic of the devil. Once you start getting these issues in here taken care of and settled, and that you know that you know that you know, and you're, this stuff that's going on up here, and it's telling you, hate yourself, you're insignificant, you're just, man, you're worthless. And I know that's extreme, but there's an extremeness, and then there's a middle of the road, and there's a beginning of the road where some of us are just kind of cruising there. And either way, whether it's extreme or not, it's still affecting you if you're listening to it. Once I started getting a hold of those thoughts, and they're like, no, in Jesus' name, the devil's like, and I'm going to tell you this because this is a warning to you. You know what he had to start doing? He had to start using external sources. External sources. And he still tries to do that to this day. And when I say an external source, he's got to use somebody else that's listening to him in order to try to bring that thing across my plate, bring it across your plate, so that you'll say, what? Wait a minute, I thought, uh, oh, well, maybe I am. Oh, my goodness. I warn you. You deal with it, but you get the barricades up. You get the boundaries in place because he will start using other people. I've seen that all through ministry for all these years. I've been traveling down this road and ministering to other people. It's like, well, I've got all my thoughts. Next thing you know, so-and-so over here did this. I'm like, okay, that's just an area that you need to work on. Because there's still something in you. If the enemy is able to use somebody to come in and wound me, then there's still an area that I've got to struggle in. The enemy ought to be able to come and say, boy, you're so insignificant. You're just worthless. Boy, you're just a piece of trash. You're, just, you, you're not even a garbage can lid. You're down there on the bottom. And I ought to be able to say, whatever. Liar, liar, your pants are going to be on fire. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes we get wounded, don't we? I'm going to tell you, if you get wounded, don't camp there. The enemy wants to take you out, and he wants to take as many others out with you as he can, folks. You need to love yourself. You need to see yourself the way God sees you. And it doesn't matter if anybody out there doesn't love you, Bring something in, accuse you. It doesn't matter what it is. You need to understand, number one, they'll answer for their sin because they're listening to the devil, but you get a hold of this right here, and it won't... Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah, I need, a, I need a child up here. Jubilee, come here. Come up here because I can't... There we go, just spread that out. Shut up, devil. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Glenda. Woo, that's it. Turn it to the, the camera so that I think some people, yeah, people are online. Shut up, devil. Is it backwards on there? Or? I can't tell. <laughs> that's what we need to do. And that's why, hey, thank you, baby. That's awesome. I'm going to keep that one. No. Ah, thank you. Hallelujah. Wear that next Sunday. That's why I tell you, you know, what's the old saying? Talk to the hand. <laughs> Just speak to the hand. I'm done here. That's okay. Do it lovingly, but I'm done here. We're done here. It's okay. So many people say that, no, 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 you can't do that. You've got to stand here and you've got to let my spirits just puke on you. Ooh, I'm putting it in reverse. Look out! They're dumping! Oh my goodness! No, I don't have to. Dr. Henry Wright, many, many years ago, I heard him say, he says, you know, <clears throat> as a pastor, I walk in an, in an anointing of the Lord to share with the body of Christ of what God wants them to hear so that they can make a decision for themselves. And he says, so many times, I've experienced it over and over and over, that when I come into the church, somebody that's got a spirit in them, whoosh, well, hey, pastor, how you doing? Blah, 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 you know? And next thing you know is they're, beep, 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 
beep, that thing's going up, tailgate's open, and they're dumping on him right before he's getting ready to get up and deliver a message. And he said, I decided years ago. And I thought it was interesting when we went to the, the church, like, where's Henry Wright? You know, of course you want to see Henry Wright. You go there and it's like, I want to see Henry. Where's Henry? He's not in here. Worship's going on and, you know, everybody's having a good time, you know, and just worshiping the Lord. And where's Henry? Is he not coming today? And then right before it's time for him to speak, he walks in, stands at the back of the church. And I learned later, and he, and he said that, he says, because it never fails, those demons through other people come in and want to dump on me so it'll steal from the body of Christ. It's okay to say no. It's okay to set a boundary. The enemy would think, would have you think that I don't need to set a boundary. I don't need to set a boundary for my mother-in-law. I don't need to set a boundary for my brother. I don't need to set a boundary for my whoever. No, no, no. You, you need to. Because if they don't got one set, then you got a mess. You got a collision that's getting ready to happen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's okay to say no. Well, it was it George Bush that did the slogan, just say no to drugs? Ah, uh, Glenda, there's the next one. Oh, my goodness. Just say no to demons or the devil or something like that. Just say no. Yeah. <laughs> this is how we get those. It's either at a teaching or a church. Praise the Lord. Predisposition. You need to understand it. You've been predisposed to hear it and to act on it. Another thought in connection to what we are experiencing outwardly from others. What are we listening to? You know, it could even be in music. It could be in talk radio. Man, even cougars don't like talk radio. Mountain lions. Did you know that? I got a buddy back in New Braunfels. He's got a mountain lion, a cougar. We had a cougar hunter come up to the mountain yesterday. That was so cool, Roy. He got his dogs out. I'm getting off on another story here. I'll try to remember the other one. He pulled up, because y'all know we, we've got some mountain lions up there. <clears throat> and we want to get them moved out, at least. I told Roy, I said, what do you do when you tree them things? I said, you just tell them you don't come back here again. He said, yes, sir. You know? <laughs> but Roy got up there. It had been raining, and it was a little wet, and... I said, well, I'm not going to run with you and the dogs. How many dogs did you bring? Six or five? He brought six. And he let those little, what are they? They're not hound dogs. They're beagles. Oh, they're hound dogs. Okay. They sounded like hound dogs. I was like, wow, that's cool. And they took off. And Roy's like, hey, I'm out of here, man. And he's off. Got his backpack on. After a while, I'm like, I wonder if Roy and the dogs got eaten by those cougars. <laughs> I called him up and I said, did you find anything? He says, ah, he says, they got on a trail. He says, and they were barking a little bit different. They were acting different, weren't they? He says, I found out they were tracking a bear instead of a, a mountain lion. Sent me a video. I would ask him to show you that. It's really cool. But that bear was like way up in the tree, man. I don't know, 20, 30 feet. And he didn't like them six hound dogs down there. Oh, oh, <laughs> it was great. Man, I don't even know where I was going with that one. <laughs> Talk radio. Oh, yeah, my friend back in Texas, he had a cougar that would come through and try to get his chickens and his peacocks and stuff like that. And he said, hey, you know what I learned, man? I was like, what? He says, I put on Talk Radio, man, and they just keep on going. I was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So, But things that were taken in, things that were processing, Anything that's fear-based. Here's a verse that you can think about in this direction. It's going to be 1 Samuel 16, 22. 1 Samuel 16, 22. And it says, And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Paul, uh, Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. 1 Samuel 16, 22. What insight 
incredible. Sin is sin, and it is a being because you cannot separate a thought from a being. What that being is wanting is for you to come into agreement with it in its thought, thought processes. That's why in the Greek word for sin, we have the word harmarsha. And it explains in the sense of a union. I can't be in union with this pulpit. I get close to it, but I'm not becoming one with it. It's still an inanimate object. But a harmarsha in, in the sense, in the, in the Greek, is in the sense of a union, becoming one with it. That's a spirit. Being one in that sense is that you are in agreement with it. The being, and that's why in faith we are in agreement with God. Come on. That's why in faith we are in agreement with God. And that's why He is pleased with us, not in the sense of He is happy or upset. I used to read that scripture, without faith it's impossible to please Him. He that comes to God must believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. I used to re read that and say, oh my God, He's not happy with me. He's so displeased with me. He doesn't love me. Uh, I'm not presentable to him. And, and man, all these things would flood in, just like what, what Amy was going through. All these negative emotions and thoughts and things like that. What it means is being in agreement. In faith, you are in agreement with God. You're in agreement with him. So therefore, when you're in faith and you're in agreement with him, you can ask whatever you will, and it'll be done. Amen? Amen? Because you're in agreement with him, therefore you're in agreement with his word. That's what it means. And the enemy used to beat me up with that one. Simply put, we are in faith, so we're in agreement with him. Therefore, his, he is in agreement with us. He can be in agreement with his word, can't he? He won't be in agreement with the devil, but he'll be in agreement with you if you're in agreement with his word. And that verse is Hebrews 11.6 that I just quoted to you. With all that said, in connection to the spiritual realm, if they were to communicate with your soul, then they would be communicating to the five physical senses, or they would communicate with you through the spirit pathway. This is called the theta pathway that I was talking about, or the theta brainwave. When you're hearing fear of abandonment and fear of rejection, you're hearing and sensing the presence of an evil spirit by its fallen nature. And the person has become one with it, in their soul. Did y'all get that video pulled up? I want to stop right there <clears throat> and let me just make a note here and we'll get further into this next Sunday. I want y'all to just listen. <clears throat> 